Good afternoon. I'm Christopher Davidson, State Archivist and Assistant Vice Chancellor for the University, uh, I'm sorry, for the Georgia Archives, which is part of the university system of uh, Georgia. I uh, have spoke to the board recently and, and talked to them about the archives, and it was an honor to get to talk to them, and it's an honor to get to talk to you. Um, I'm actually going to be traveling throughout the state this year more, uh, visiting all the institutions of the uh, university system. Uh, North Georgia is part of the university system, and so I'll be coming back hopefully soon to talk with the uh, archives and records management folks here about the activities that they have going on. What I hope to talk you take away today is a better idea of what an archives is, how the Georgia archives can help you as students and as citizens, that public sector employment can be a wonderful career, and a little bit more about some of the documents you've been studying. As I talk, I'm going to get off on tangents and, and just kind of bear with me. I'll be all over the place, but we're going to cover these, these main topics um, as, as we go through this. First, to help you visualize what we do at the archives, I'd like to show you a video. Let me see if I can get this to work. One of the, as uh, Nathan mentioned, we're now part of the university system. Uh, we're a very small agency, and being part of the system gives us access to a lot of uh, different things, including technology. And so this video was put together by the USG system office's IT staff, and it's, it's something we never could have done on our own. Um, and, and so we're very happy to be able to work with them. Here you see our, our first building. The archives was founded in 1918, and we were housed at the Capitol until 1930. And then we moved to Rhodes Hall from 1930 to 1965. Um, this is a very beautiful uh, piece of architecture and it's, it's still standing, um, but it wasn't a very good place for an archives. Uh, the squirrels got in there and started to eat the records and, and that was a, a big problem. Uh, supposedly, when we were at the Capitol, one of the big problems was the janitors would light the fireplaces uh, each morning with some of the records from the archives, also a uh, very big problem. And uh, that's, that's what happens when you're not in control of uh, your building. Uh, this is the uh, archives, it became the Fortson uh, building named after uh, Ben Fortson, who was a longtime Secretary of State, a big supporter of the archives. 
and uh, we were there from 1965 to 2003. Um, this building was imploded a few years ago. As, as Nathan mentioned, it's, uh, it's now uh, being built upon and it's the, gonna be the um, judicial center. Uh, you, if you've ever seen the man, movie Ant-Man, the archives is actually the building that's in there that's the headquarters of the uh, bad guys and it blows up. They could have uh, waited a little while and blowed it up for real instead of having to do it digitally. Uh, the, also for uh, many years, uh, images were shot onto the side of it at night to kind of serve as a backdrop uh, and used in several commercials. You can see the uh, Capitol building in the background. Uh, the interstate is nearby where this location and as the interstate was expanded, uh, the ground became unstable. Uh, this building actually, because of the weight and the vibrations, started to sink and twist and so pieces of the outside started to fall. Um, we had problems with technology. It's uh, thick concrete. It's not easy to drill through that, add uh, networks, um, and a lot, just a lot of problems. So we needed a new building, and it was built in Morrow right in front of Clayton State, and that's where we are now. Uh, we moved there in 2003. Um, the, Nash the National Archives at Atlanta is housed right next to us, uh, which is a misleading name because it's not in Atlanta. It's actually on the border of Morrow and Lake City. And it's not really, it, calling it the National Archives of Atlanta makes it seem something that it's really not. It used to be known as the uh, Archives for the Southeastern Region of the US, which is a more apt title. They house uh, the federal records for Georgia and surrounding states, such as uh, Port of Entry, uh, records from Savannah, uh, from New Orleans, um, records of federal employees in the southeast, uh, south agencies that are housed in the southeast, such as TVA. So if you want to research federal records relating to the southeast or any of those topics, you would go to the archives next door to us. Uh, it's the only instance in the country where a branch of the federal archives is located near a state archives. It's nice, some of our researchers are able to come and research both facilities all in one visit. Uh, that location was chosen because the National Archives was there because Clayton State is right next door. It was going to create a, a hub of us all working together and then the recession hit and some of the developments in the area just have never materialized. Uh, the, both the National Archives and the Georgia Archives have suffered uh, different funding crises over the last 10 years and never really been able to, to work together the way we want to. As I said in the video, our mission is to collect, preserve, and provide access to the historic records of Georgia and its people, and to assist state and local governments with records management. This last part is really more where my background came into place. I worked in Alabama, focusing a lot on records management, and as I came to Georgia, I got more into the archives side of it, and we'll talk more about that as, as we go along. Um, when I go out and talk, I, I like to try and pull some of the images from uh, our collections that relate to the local area. And I'll show you in a minute how to get to uh, these images and others that may help you in your research. Here you see a bear show from 1892 in Dahlonega where three Frenchmen brought two bears to town. Uh, you probably wouldn't see this happening uh, nowadays with just some bears on the side of the road. Here you see some North Georgia college students from Dahlonega in 1898. Um, the clothing is, is much different there than, than it is now. Uh, there's two in the back row that are probably cadets in cadet uniforms. Um, uh, North Georgia was and still is military uh, focused. There you see a shot of Dahlonega in 1899, very, very different uh, from, from now to then. And uh, here's an image of our vault where we have collections. Our building is four stories of vaults similar to this, surrounded by three stories of public and private work areas. Let's see. We have over 260 million documents from 1733 to the present, including over 194,000 reels of microfilm over 20,000 library books, 
and over 100,000 photographs. We do have a library area. Uh, I'll show it to you later. But you can see what books we have by going into the uh, various catalogs at the universities, but we do not participate in the interlibrary loan and we don't loan books out. So if you want to see any of our books, you actually have to come there and look at them while you're there. We have most of the acts of the General Assembly, court records, birth, death, and marriage records, building plans, land records, records of war, and records relating to Native Americans. We are the repository for the permanent records of the state of Georgia. So most of our collections are from state agencies. Uh, we do have some records from local governments. Those that we have are generally going to be microfilm uh, copies because it makes sense for the actual permanent records of a county to stay in that county uh, for the citizens. But it's also ne we, it's important for us to have copies of those so that when people come to research at the state uh, in the central location, they have access to all the county records. So over, over the decades, the last couple centuries, we've made an effort to microfilm as much as we could. Now more and more of the records are being scanned, not necessarily by us, but by ancestry or family search. Um, they make deals with the local governments to scan those without charge, but then they get to keep a copy so that they can provide it to their uh, customers through their websites. Here you see another image. This is a dredge boat on the Chestate River near Dahlonega. This is from a special collection of records that we have from one of the state agencies. The, uh, this is a mines, mining, and geology, and it, it has a lot of collection of uh, images from the area that uh, deal with uh, gold mining. Uh, most of you probably know that this was a big gold mining area. That's part of why the Native Americans were pushed out of the area, was trying to get the land for the gold. Let's see. We also have some private collections uh, where we talk with either businesses or private individuals to get their records. Uh, our largest private collection, and when I say private, it doesn't mean it's closed to the public view viewing, it just means it came from the private as opposed to a government agency. And so the largest coll single collection is Robert and Company. It's an architectural firm. And so we have lots of building plans and project files on a lot of buildings in the southeast, uh, government buildings from D.C., uh, military bases from around the world. Some of those are not open to the public uh, because they're sensitive. One of the special documents we have that's related to what y'all have been talking about is the Royal Charter that established the colony of Georgia. This is not the original signed by the king. Uh, this was when uh, the colonists came over, they went to South Carolina, and it was transcribed into the records of South Carolina. And then in, uh, what year? In 1965, at the dedication of the Fort, what became the Fortson Building, South Carolina gave us this document, and uh, inscribed on the right side is uh, when they gave it to us, uh, referring to Georgia as, its, as South Carolina's eldest daughter, and, and giving us our... Uh, document. As you see here, this is the cursive. Uh, Y'all probably read uh, some of the uh, a transcription or at least talk about it. Here you see the cursive. It's, it's very neat and tidy and this is not the case with a lot of the cursive written documents that we have, and including this one, which is the um, document y'all did look at, the resolution of the trustees. I'm sorry, it is the no, I can't see the title. But it's where the trustees have turned over the colony to the king and are arguing, please, our experiment has failed, but Georgia should not be under the rule of South Carolina. Georgia has its own laws and should be continuing to follow its own laws. And this is a very, very early example of states' rights, which that same argument continues to today of is this a country made up of individual states with their own rights, or is the, how much control should the federal government have in making all the states be the same? And so here you see a uh, early example of that. I've got the two printed here to really show the difference between the printed a transcription and the cursive. We're finding more and more researchers don't know how to read cursive. Uh, it's, it's almost a foreign language to them and they expect us to be able to translate it for them, and, and we don't have transcriptions of most of our documents. And so if you come in and you can't read cursive, you can't research in these documents. 
which is a huge portion of what we have is handwritten cursive documents. Um, even if you can read cursive, you have to have some special training and knowledge to really translate all of the cursive because the, the legal words that they use, the way they used words in certain ways, some of the abbreviations, sometimes the cursive doesn't look like the cursive that we're used to as well. And our staff can help you with that, but they're not going to sit down and, and transcribe everything for you. We have the official copy, sign, official signed copy of at least six of Georgia's constitutions, uh, and we have unofficial copies of the rest of them. Uh, you've been discussing Georgia's constitutions to some extent. Uh, I find that not only are the documents and the words within them interesting, but the actual documents themselves, how they were created, um, and also the methods of their creation. Uh, at first, representatives created and approved the constitutions. Later, committees created the constitutions, which the General Assembly approved and the voters ratified. Over time, the new constitutions were passed as an amendment instead of re starting from scratch, and it's a document. They actually made it as an amendment to the previous document to replace the previous document. So in Georgia's history, seven of the constitutions were revised by constitutional convention, two by constitutional commission, and one by the Office of Legislative Council of the Georgia General Assembly. Even the actual material of the documents have ch changed over time. This one here is the 1798 Constitution. Anybody want to guess what that is? What it, what is written on? It is animal skin. We, we think it was probably a deer or a goat. Uh, at that time, only the most important documents that, that were going to have a lasting, uh, needed to last, would be written on skin, and this is an example of it. Um, for the age, those words are actually uh, quite well preserved. This doesn't really reflect how well preserved they are. Um, to the paper, it's the material itself, the animal skin, is in wonderful condition. Um, and and it's, it's done its job. It's lasted like it's supposed to. And this is one of the ones that we have at the archives. It's a pretty massive uh, document. It's only eight pages long, um, and, but it's about twice as long as the previous constitution that it replaced from 1789. Uh, it was cr this document was created in part because the previous document, previous constitution was so short. It was very vague. It didn't really prescribe a lot of uh, specifics, and, and it also resulted in the Yazoo land fraud, which was a big deal. And there was a lot of public outcry. Um, that period of history is fascinating. That instance is fascinating. Uh, it resulted in all of the records related to the Yazoo land fraud were burned to, so that no one would ever have proof that it really even happened. That's how big a deal it was. They wanted to wipe it out of history. And so the Constitution was written in part in response to that. Uh, the new uh, Constitution of 1798 uh, carefully defined the legislature. It can, slavery was continued, but it did have the ban that starting in 1798, new slaves could not be brought into Georgia. Uh, this document was uh, only amended 23 times. One of those amendments was the creation of the Georgia Supreme Court in 1835. But the legislature didn't fund the Supreme Court for another 10 years after it was created. And here we have much different physically from that 1798 animal skin constitution is the 1983 constitution. This is in regular paper. It's very not impressive when you set it next to the other one on a desk. It just looks like a stack of paper. It's, it's not even bound. Uh, it's 113 pages. And uh, that's 70 pages shorter than its predecessor, the 1976 Constitution. The, our, this Constitution is really considered the first truly new Constitution in Georgia since 1877. The others kind of address the same things. They improved on each other, but they never really had a great change from 1877 until the current 1983. Like the National Archives, we take the protection of our documents seriously. So all these documents, uh, all the constitutions, the charter, we keep those in our separate treasures vault within one of the vaults at the archives. It has its own uh, 
climate controls. All of the vaults have climate controls. We have a specific temperature range, specific humidity range. We keep all the documents at. We have high security. Um, we want these documents to uh, continue to exist. And the budget of the archives, most of the budget goes toward the building itself and our electricity. At one point, we were spending about $20,000 a month on, on our utilities. Uh, we've got that down with some improvements. Uh, part of that because we moved to the university system and can start spending some larger amounts to make the building even better. But it, it takes a lot to run the uh, humidity and temperature controls. Um, it's more important that humidity and temperature is maintained at a constant uh, setting than it is a, a specific high or low. Uh, you definitely don't want your temperature and humidity fluctuating. If you think of papers you have at home, if you keep your paper uh, in the attic or in a garage, it's gonna be in a lot less con good shape than what you're keeping in your house. Uh, even if your house is either too hot or too cold, it's not gonna fluctuate nearly as much as, as an attic or a basement. Um, I have a lot of experience in Alabama, actually more than I do in Georgia, um, so my staff gets tired of sometimes I'll, when we talk about a solution to a problem, I say, well, in Alabama, we such and such. Uh, they really get tired of that. But that's, that's what I know more than anything. I know more about Alabama history than I do about Georgia history. Um, one of the really neat things Alabama has done recently with their constitutions is restore all of them and put them on exhibit. It's Alabama, it has been Alabama's 200th anniversary of their statehood, and so they've made a big deal about their constitutions and the exhibit was very nice and it was interesting what they did. They brought in speakers and, and had an exhibit and they really didn't shy around some of the issues of the creation of those constitutions. Because to really understand a document and what you're reading, you have to understand the time period in which it was created and the thinking of the people who created it. And, and so the current Constitution in Alabama is their 1901 Constitution, and it was created to support rights, white supremacy. It's, it's obvious the, uh, the, the notes of the convention itself, they admitted that's the whole reason they were creating it. That's from 1901 to today, same Constitution. It's actually the lo longest Constitution in the world. Um, as of uh, 2018, it was 310,296 words long, it's 12 times longer than the average state constitution, 44 times longer than the U.S. Constitution. It's the most amended constitution in the world. Um, part of that is because almost every decision is controlled by that constitution. Um, there is very little local rule. If a county wants to do something that just affects its county, more than likely it still has to be a statewide amendment to allow a county to make its own decisions. And so they keep adding to this document. And so that's, that's in contrast to Georgia's constitution, which is much more recent, much shorter, and is, uh, has been amended very fewer times. And it's also was created in a very different climate in Georgia in the 80s versus uh, Alabama in 1901. This is our library, which I mentioned. Uh, most of our library books are out there for you to browse. We do have some that are uh, either in, in such a condition that they can't be handled on library shelves or that they're so valuable we just feel we need to keep them uh, safe in the vault. But you're free to browse the shelves, uh, look online before you come. Uh, we have some people that that's all they do is just look at the uh, library books, sit at our tables. We have plenty of space for that. Here you see in the same area, but this we have 16 computer terminals. Um, those that aren't familiar with Ancestry, Ancestry and Family Search are both uh, subscription databases where you can do a lot of genealogy research. You can do a little bit for free. Most of it you have to pay for around $100 a year. We have agreements with them that we can provide it free to our uh, patrons. If you come in, you can spend all day, if you like, just researching your genealogy on Family Search. Ancestry and several other databases that we have. We also have uh, subscriptions to some of the newspaper sites, including the uh, Atlanta Journal 
and we really encourage people to don't print to paper. If you print anything on paper, we have to charge you a small fee. If you bring a jump drive and save it to your jump drive, we don't charge. Uh, the same with any of our photo services where if you're printing it yourself, even on the microfilm, we don't charge. And as long as you're keeping it on the jump drive, if you print to paper, we have to charge you. Here's our original document reading area. Uh, this is where if you wanna actually see the permanent records that are in the vaults, we bring them down here and you come in here. We're very restrictive on what you can bring in here. We don't even allow white paper in there. If you need to take notes, we'll give you a purple piece of paper. That way when you walk out with something that's not purple, you've accidentally picked up a permanent record and, and we'll get it back to where it goes. Uh, we have lots of space in here. It's, it's a very nice setup the way they set up the building. It's very functional. In the larger area, we can at times serve many, many patrons with only one staff member out there. Uh, this room, we don't have a staff member in here unless someone wants to see the records. You can't tell, there's a window back there. These two rooms back up to each other so a staff member in either one can see what's going on in the other room and can call for uh, more uh, staff to come. The staff offices are close by to this. So staff are able to move back and forth between working with the public and working at their desk on other projects. And so it's, it was well laid out to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, sometimes our staff don't have to do anything but kind of monitor the room and maybe answer some questions about technological issues to do with printing. Uh, other times they'll sit with a patron and just really teach them how to do research. Uh, so it's very important that you use the archives as you do research. There's an archives here at North Georgia that may be able to help you as you do more advanced research that's related to Georgia history and government, encourage you to come to the archives and do research with us. And, and if you do come, please ask our staff for help. They're, they don't mind. if It doesn't matter if, if you've been researching for years or if it's your first time, they're really happy to help you. Uh, one thing you can do to help yourself is if you're doing a, a topic, especially for school, is to plan ahead. You can go on our website and find out a lot of information about what we have and maybe have a list of what you need to see before you come. You may even send that to our staff so they have it sitting there waiting on you when you come and, and view it here in the uh, original document reading area. Uh, we Later this month, we'll have a Fulbright scholar coming from overseas to stay with us for over a month. And so she planned ahead and has made arrangements with us so that she can get the most of her time. And I encourage you to do that because um, you it's a long trek, and you don't want to have to keep going back and forth. You want to be able to get as much done as you can all at once. After you've written this wonderful paper for your class, and if you've used archives, either ours or others, you may qualify for a Georgia Historic Records Advisory Council Award. Uh, here are the uh, topics and, and categories, and you can get information on this from our website. But if, if you do a really good job, I suggest you have you or your professor or someone nominates you for one of these awards. Uh, the, the youngest levels, which you are beyond, uh, the Friends of Georgia Archives and History actually contribute $50 to the winners. So y'all would not qualify for that unless uh, some of y'all are also dually enrolled in, in high school or, or lower. Before we go on, I want to take a second and see if we can get to the internet and I want to show y'all our website. It's uh, georgiaarchives.org. It'd help if I could spell or type. All right. And so here you see announcements of any of the events we have going on. Um, there are grant opportunities for local governments uh, through the GRAC, the NHPRC, a federal agency that gives grants out. Um, our African American event is coming up February 1st. And then we have a uh, workshop series for conservation and preservation. Um, if you're interested in a career involving preservation or conservation, these would be really good uh, workshops. Uh, Georgia does not 
have a uh, conservation preservation program in any of its institutions, which is not odd because the North America only has four. It's very competitive, and so anyone interested in conservation preservation work, these type of workshops or internships with us uh, really help to get into those uh, four programs. Our newsletter from the vaults, but what I really want you to look at is our virtual vault over here on the right. And so when I, those images I pulled out, including the ones of the Constitution, it was just a matter of me coming here and doing a search. Uh, uh, counties or topics or anything, uh, you can type in. Um, sometimes with more uh, luck than others, these are all just Fort Gaines because it has the word North and Georgia somewhere in it. Um, but I encourage you, as you do research, and if you're going to have presentations, this is a wonderful place to get images. Uh, or if you want to see some of the documents that we've uh, scanned, you can see them here. Um, to see the finding aids is going to list all of our records, uh, but they're not going to necessarily be scanned. The gill is where you want to look at our private records or any of our books. And we're not the only place to go throughout the state to do research in an archives. This historical organizations directory is a good place to look as you travel around the state. If you're researching a specific area, these will show you some archives in that area that you can go visit uh, to do primary research. Um, and we think in terms of doing research because it's a history or political science, because that makes sense. The archives have government, records of government, records of history. We also a great place for other subjects. We have book, if you want to talk about the history of math, we have some early books that show uh, how math was used. Um, if you want to talk about trees and the land, many of our early plats uh, will show where the surveyor actually drew and, and labeled what kind of tree was in an area. Uh, they're actually using that as they want to try and return, reforest some of the state with its original type of trees. They're actually looking at our records to see what types of trees were noted as being there in early part of Georgia's history. Uh, we've learned a lot about one of the early tornadoes because they marked on some of these maps where all these trees fell down, and it's because a tornado which came through. Interesting, at the time, they called it a hurricane instead of tornado, and that is actually documented in these maps. Uh, we're starting to learn a lot of new ways to use the records that we had uh, in new ways that we hadn't thought of before. A lot of our tax and property records are being used for genealogical purposes because they list people's names. And so as a ge genealogist are doing research, they're looking for anything with their name because a lot of uh, individuals, it's hard to find documentation, especially slaves. And so Sometimes in a property list may be enough information to learn about the heritage of a slave, which then allows that person to track their ancestors farther than they would have been able to otherwise. That's Penny, who goes out around the state giving presentations to uh, students at all levels, uh, talking about the archives, uh, some of what I'm talking about today, trying to talk with professors uh, to get people aware of the archives. Don't feel bad if you've never heard of an archives before or never realized the state archives existed. Most people don't know we exist. Uh, surprisingly, many professors don't know we exist. And so we're having to do a better job of educating everyone so that they have a reason to come to the archives. You have to understand the services we have, otherwise you're not gonna be able to take advantage of our services. So Penny works to put together our monthly Lunch and Learn lecture series where we bring in speakers to talk on a variety of topics. Uh, sometimes it's a book, a author of a book talking about their project. Uh, we've had Mrs. Deal came in and, and talked about the book she put together, which by the way, she happened to be researching at the archives during the budget crisis and she was happy with the archives and then everything worked out. So maybe she was our savior. But, uh, and the fact she's married to the, the governor at the time. Uh, so uh, it's all, always important to take care of everyone. Uh, and so not just Mrs. Deal that was able to speak on our behalf, but we really had a big constituent of people who talking with them 
they never thought in their lives they would be protesting. And they showed up at the uh, Capitol and protested. And it was, it was a bunch of older retired ladies for the most part out there protesting because they really felt that strongly about the archives. Part of it is because of our staff. Um, no one was gonna come battle for a bunch of staff members that are, are rude and don't help the public. Uh, that's why it's one of the most important things I do is, is hire staff. It's, it's much like the president appointing Supreme Court justices. It's a long-term uh, decision. Many instances it may be those employees are gonna be there long after I leave. Um, it's very difficult to get rid of a mediocre employee. So we spend a lot of time interviewing staff, uh, applicants, going through, weeding people out, uh, conducting phone interviews, conducting in-person interviews, because that's the face of the archives. I don't see nearly as many members of the public as my staff do. I'm hidden away upstairs. I may get to come out on occasion and talk. Most of my job is dealing with my employees. If I do a good job of hiring employees, it's me dealing with the employees in a way that is, it's helping them become better employees as opposed to me dealing with bad employees that I'm trying to find some way to fix or manage or get out of the door. That's a lot, it's a lot more difficult to fire someone than it is to take the time to hire someone and not have personnel issues. Um, you can't always hire the right person, there's mistakes, but if you take the time, it's, it's very important. That's why it's very important for all of y'all as you're progressing in college, thinking of your, your degree, thinking of your career down the road to really make yourself an easy hire. Um, I'm surprised by the number of applicants that we get that really look good on paper, but they can't interview. And it's because no one's ever really explained to them how to interview. So I encourage all of y'all, if it's interviewing with your friends, your classmates, taking classes, um, get as much practice interviewing as you can. Uh, I, always, I always applied for jobs if I was remotely interested in them. Even if I didn't get the job, at least I had some practice interviewing. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult for us to find a way to give criticism to an applicant. Um, but, but many times, it's, it's just a matter of they haven't practiced. They haven't thought about questions. Uh, one of the, tr if you want to call it a trick question we ask that really gives us some insight into the person is, what did you think about our website? Most of the time, they've never looked at our website. If you're gonna apply for any entity, you should know enough about it to go and look at its website. And if you haven't looked at it, don't lie and try and fake that you've looked at it, because that comes off as even worse. But that's, that's some of the things we deal with. Um, as I'm on my soapbox, also uh, take a communication class. The system, I believe, requires communication for everyone. Um, Dr. Denley, my boss, uh, the executive vice chancellor over academic affairs, has done a lot of work with studying uh, the students of the university system. That's one of the offshoots that I really enjoy in my position is I get to see a lot of what goes on behind the scenes of running the entire system, of how does a curriculum come together? How do they determine what required courses you have? Um, and a lot of that is hearing from students complaints about the way it's set up, and a lot of it is just seeing the statistics. But one of the statistics is that how you do in a communication class is one of the biggest determinations of how you do the rest of your college career. If, if you fail in communication, it's very difficult to pass elsewhere. And a lot of it is because communication is organizing and expressing your, your thoughts. If you can't convey your thoughts, no matter what they are, and it's not just in English and history and political science, it's everything. If you're a, a, a chemist and you discover the cure for cancer, if you can't convey that to someone else, it's useless. And so I really encourage you not just to do as well as you can in your required communication classes, but consider other communication classes, especially in graduate level, and other ways to continue to communicate. I always hated networking uh, when I started my career. I, I, didn't I saw the benefit of it, but I just hated it. But, but I learned over time, you have to force yourself to network. It, it pays off in the end. Uh, and one way to do that is to go elsewhere, go to conferences, and just talk to people that aren't in your normal sphere. 
That way you can kind of, you can embarrass yourself and it doesn't really matter. At least that's how it worked for me. Uh, like I said, I'm all over the place. And so uh, we have our lunch and learn every month. It's the, I believe it's the second Friday from 12 to one. It's free of charge. All of our basic services are free of charge. Um, it's, it's rare that we have to charge for anything unless it's like a special workshop where we're bringing someone in or this new conservation series of workshops that's going to be more and more closer aligned with, with being credit uh, giving and those will charge. This is uh, last year's African American program. It's each February, I think it's this February 1st. If you're interested in, in the area, uh, look on our website. We have a, George, a genealogy day in October, a geolo genealogy picnic in the summer. Uh, here's some uh, reenactors. We have a, uh, every quarter we have a new exhibit. Uh, also in February for Georgia Day, we bring out the uh, charter and our copy of the Declaration of Independence, which is on its display here. Um, that's our conservation lab. As far as we know, it's the nicest conservation lab at a state archives in the country. Uh, they really did a nice job of outfitting this. Uh, it meets all of our needs. Uh, there's very few conservation labs in the state. Uh, UGA has a lab modeled on this, but they never got the funding to actually buy any equipment or hire a conservator, so it became a storage room. Uh, so we're very, very proud of this. We have uh, two staff members working in here. Most of what they do is, is preserving our records, rebinding books, putting maps back together, uh, and, and these maps look like a, a big puzzle with pieces all over the place, but the staff really enjoy doing that. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to say about that. Another activity of my job that I, I really enjoy is working with location scouts. Um, Nathan really did a wonderful job of, of really pushing to get the uh, film industry in the state, uh, and, and it's been amazing. Uh, Pinewood Studio, if you ever get the opportunity, I encourage you to visit there and, and tour the facility. It's in uh, Fayetteville. Um, it's, it's just amazing the economic impact on the state. The archives also gets some impact from this. Uh, we have uh, some areas of the building that we don't use, so we're able to lease that out to filming. Um, here's uh, Film Clayton. They, we work with them to let the location scouts know that we're film friendly. So we're, I, I get to meet with the scouts, help them figure out ways to transform our regular office space into something like a hospital room or the MacGyver headquarters, uh, which MacGyver's been there three different times. Um, it's been cool to see behind the scenes how movies are made, get a piece of the magic. Unfortunately, now that I've seen behind the curtain of magic, TV doesn't really have the same appeal. I, I know it's all fake and, and, and I, I see how it all comes together um, and how I, watching actors be thrown down our stairs was not expected. And, and that's one of the things I've really learned is we have to negotiate the contracts. Um, I, I have a law degree which has helped me with the legal aspects of negotiating a contract, but I never really realized until I've learned over each one how far somebody's going to push. If it's not in that contract, they're going to try and take advantage of it. Um, no one told me they were going to be flinging each other down the stairs. Um, so we really have to ask a lot of questions and, and we're now to the point where we know what to ask. Uh, one of my employees who works in the conservation lab uh, acts as our site rep, so she gets to interact with a lot of those people. I've met uh, Kelly Clarkson, uh, Jason Bateman, Tricia Yearwood, um, Noah Wiley, and it's, it's just been interesting to interact with the, them and also know that I'm part of this bigger picture of, of really helping the economy of Georgia. Our conservation staff, not only do they help our items in our building, they also help across the state in disaster planning and disaster recovery. In 2014, Hancock County's courthouse burned to the ground. It was basically acted as though it was a big chimney. The building used to be heated by coal. Someone left like a ton of coal in the basement, so when the building caught fire, it was just a giant chimney and, and burned everything up. Um, Side note, the probate judge was under uh, investigation 
and, and, and was indicted by the feds and was the last person in the building. But that has nothing to do with the fire. Um, <laughs> so here you see some of the items that were pulled out and we were not able to help save any of these. It was just too far gone, too massive, but we were able to, to talk with them, give them advice. As I mentioned very early on, we help with records management. Sometimes the best thing is, is identifying, well, that record actually could have been destroyed, and so they can legally destroy it, and then you don't have to pay money to recover it. Uh, they did get some money, uh, I think, from the insurance policy to recover some of their records. Thankfully, a lot of them were backed up on microfilm, so we just made scans of the microfilm and gave it to them, uh, and we were able to get them back up and running. That is all the images I have, but I will uh, now talk about my favorite subject, me. Um, I was appointed state archivist in 2012 by uh, then Secretary of State Brian Kemp. I came from Alabama where I, for five years I was over Alabama Department of Transportation's Archives and Records Management Program. I helped establish that program and, and got it off its feet and it is still going now. Before that I spent 10 years at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. Um, as a full-time employee with a couple years prior to that as a student worker. I started moving boxes in their uh, warehouse um, and then started working with state agencies. Um, I think I helped three governors pack up their records and move. And, and when I say helped a governor pack up the records, they told us which records we could get. Um, I almost ran over uh, then Governor Siegelman with a cart in the hallway. Um, I've helped uh, following a flood in, uh, I think in Op, not Op, I can't think of the name of the town in Alabama that kept flooding uh, because if you build your town in the middle of a river that circles the town, it's eventually going to flood. Um, so I've had a variety of things in, in my career. Um, what's been interesting lately is because we've had some issues at our record center, we've taken some budget cuts, we moved from West End of Atlanta to Austell. Uh, close to 200,000 boxes. Because our moving company was a mistake to go with the moving company we went with and because of some issues, I've actually been moving boxes again. So my, my career in archives has come full circle from, from working in a warehouse to working in a warehouse. I'll be at a warehouse tomorrow driving a forklift because currently I'm on the only one on the staff can, that can drive the forklift. And so it's, it's, it's been interesting. So tomorrow I'll be figuring out how to deal with our most recent budget cut while also moving boxes around on a forklift. Um, but it, it's, it's just part of the job. Um, a lot of my time uh, every day is spent on budget and staffing issues. Uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, in Alabama at the uh, Department of Transportation, it was the same issue was dealing with, with employees there. It was a lot of problem employees. Uh, many times it wasn't the employee's problem. It, it was their managers caused them to be bad employees. And then instead of dealing with the employees, they gave them to me. And then I dealt with them. Uh, hope, trying to rehab them, which was not necessarily what the previous manager wanted done. Um, I feel like it's if you can you can try to rehab employees. Many times you can because it's not the employee's fault, it's their managers. If an employee is not taught how to be an employee, they're not going to be a good employee. I think that's something Alabama as a state did better than Georgia does because Alabama had more of a central personnel office, was actually training employees how to be employees and training managers how to be a manager. Um, and, and at the archives, that's something I, I really try to work on, is, is training staff how to be both an employee and a manager. I received my BA, in, I'm, I'm all over the place, I probably should have started with this, but I received my BA in history and my Master of Liberal Arts in Southern Literature and Southern History. Uh, and I attended about half of a Master of Public Administration. All three, of the, all of that from AUM, and I have a law degree from Jones School of Law in Montgomery. And of all of those, the one I use the most is the one I didn't even finish, and that was the Master of Public Administration, because I learned about HR and HR law and managing people and some of the advanced things you can do with an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, most of my work is right now Excel spreadsheets. I, I, I love them, my staff hate them, because I have so many of them 
and it's nice. I have three monitors, so I can have a spreadsheet e open up on each one. Uh, lately, it's been a lot of looking at the budget. Um, wrap it up real quick, and then I'll take some questions. I really enjoy being a public servant because I, I've, I am contributing to the state. I'm, as a public servant, I should be held to a high level of responsibility, of uh, ethical awareness. Um, every employee should welcome an audit because an audit just verifies that you're doing what's right. You shouldn't be hiding from an audit because that means you're doing something wrong. The same with the newspaper. The newspaper needs to investigate. They need to investigate. And so part of that, I think public service is a, a wonderful career, and I think you should all consider it. But I wouldn't say everyone should go into public service because I've seen so many times people can't make the transition from a private job to public because there are more strict rules. There is a high standard. You're having to deal with the public. And so uh, to use the mantra of the, the Marine Corps a while ago, it's the few, the proud public servant because not everybody can do that. And, and I really enjoy uh, being able to do that, having the opportunity, uh, knowing I have the responsibility for the records of the state. Uh, at the end of the day, I can go to any government in the state and deem something permanent. And if, it, if I deem it permanent, it cannot be thrown away without violating the law. Um, unfortunately, I have no uh, enforcement power. I can't take a gun and take the papers from anybody. Uh, but that hasn't been a, a need. The, the government of the state seems to really understand that the records are important and they do the best they can to take care of them. <laughs>